Intro Experience 2014, and uh, we have a great program tonight. And But before we begin, I'd like to uh, indulge myself by uh, playing a few commercial messages on you about upcoming speakers. So just bear with me. We've got a great lineup. Uh, in addition to Jesse Price speaking tonight, uh, on October 9th, we have Brad Edmondson, who's a business writer, uh, wrote a few books. The most recent one is a book called Ice Cream Social about Ben and Jerry's, the company's struggle to maintain its social mission through uh, you know, the sale of the company in all the early days. It's a great story. He may have a few former uh, Ben and Jerry executives with him. He'll be here on October 9th, right here. Uh, then sometime in late October, we're still confirming a date, we have uh, Dr. Nadja Jembayeva. I got that right. And, and she is uh, uh, going to talk about uh, economic uh, sustainability in a, in a world of decreasing resources. And she's something of an expert on the subject. Uh, she has written a book recently, uh, which the title takes you off track, at least took me off track. Overfished Ocean Strategy, which I thought might be an interesting tome about the fisheries and this and that. Now, it's about this whole topic of uh, sustainability in a world without resources. And she's an excellent speaker. And then uh, November 11th, uh, what, which uh, something that I'm really looking forward to. Every year, I try to have uh, at least one former uh, student from the BYO Biz program uh, come back and give a talk about what they're doing with their entrepreneurial life. And this year, we're very excited because Marguerite Dibble is a 2012 graduate and has a uh, thriving little uh, game development studio here in Burlington who will be back to talk about her adventures in entrepreneurship. So that's the fall lineup. I won't uh, tell you about the spring lineup because you'll forget anything. But that, <laughs> without further ado, it is my great pleasure. Um, and I always take great pleasure in introducing our speakers, but I take special, especially great pleasure in introducing tonight's speaker because I have known Jesse Price for at least, I won't say exactly, but I can't remember, about 35 plus years, right? 40. Okay. <laughs> I guess for 40 years. <laughs> and uh, I could tell you, um, well, I won't tell you any of her adventures in her childhood. She might want to share some. Uh, but I'll tell you, uh, I can tell you she's a graduate, art history graduate of Williams College. I can tell you that she was on the Junior Olympic Luge team as a teenager. Uh, and I can tell you lots of other stuff. But I, what I want to say about Jesse is in those 40, 40 years that I've known Jesse, I have never met another person who has the ability to extract every ounce of joy fun out of every minute of her existence. And that is, I've, I've seen that consistently about you, and I've tried to emulate emulate that when I can. I don't come close. <laughs> uh, but I think that's a wonderful uh, gift that you have, and it's, uh, it shows up in just about everything you do. So without further ado, except I got a genius mom. Jesse's mom. The whole peanut gallery of friends is John, her husband, John. And lots of friends. So Jesse, please come up here and make a fool of myself. All right, thank you, Bob. And um, actually, your introduction was very sweet, saying that I get the most joy out of everything, and it is actually very apropos given what I titled my presentation today, which is why I have the coolest job ever and how I got the coolest job ever. Um, so I really, I, I do have a lot of fun in everything I do, including in my job. And um, for me, being editor in chief of Eating Well Magazine is the coolest job. I actually used to think that I had the coolest job, my last job, which was food editor at Eating Well. So. Um, 
I'll tell you a little bit about how I got there. But to start out with, I'm going to introduce you to Eating Well. What is Eating Well? What do we do? What are we all about? Um, I'm going to talk about Eating Well's path to success. So we're a traditional magazine, but we've actually seen a lot of success. And um, that's not something you can say for every magazine these days um, in a world where print publishing is having a lot of challenges. Um, then we're going to talk about where's Eating Well going and then get to my personal part. So what is an editor-in-chief anyway? And um, then my secret recipe. These are my five, I think I did five lessons of how to succeed. So um, eating well, a little background for you guys. Um, it's from Vermont. We started out here in Vermont 20 years ago. And it's a natural place for eating well to have started. Um, just like the picture shows, Vermont is all about healthy food, where your food comes from, artisanal food, farm to table, um, you know, the most cheesemakers per capita in the U.S., the most artisanal brewmasters per capita in the U.S. So eating well um, and Vermont has always been a natural fit and that's always been at the core of what we've talked about as a brand. Um, but over the years, over the past 20 years, um, Healthy has evolved in the U.S. And 20 years ago when we started, another big magazine, our biggest rival, started at the same time. Their name is Cooking Light. Um, and that is very indicative of where Healthy was 20 years ago. 20 years ago, it was very much about eating less. It was about deprivation and, um, you know, the, the grapefruit diet and low fat and all of that stuff. And meanwhile, we had always come from this place of eating better, eating deliciously, enjoying your food, but eating healthfully at the same time. Um, so today, the marketplace has very much shifted and come towards where eating well is. So we happen to be at a very um, lucky spot, let's just say. The brand was already positioned in a way, and the market has been coming towards us. So this quote is from the uh, co-CEO of Whole Foods. Um, and he says, there's a whole revolution going on around food now that isn't limited to the coast. Consumers know more about food, where it comes from, what's in it, and the connection between diet and health. And this is something that Eating Well talks about every day and that's really becoming part of the mainstream. So this is a philosophy statement that we put together um, this past year, but it sums up what we are all about. Um, for more than 20 years, Eating Well has been at the forefront of what Americans now embrace, the rewards of eating better. Our experts offer delicious recipes, balanced nutritional advice, thought-provoking stories, and new ways to make healthy choices more exciting. So whether you're making changes big or small, Eating Well is a way of life, a place where everything is good. So. Our tagline plays right into that, where good taste meets good health. You can be healthy, you can eat well, you can have it all. Um, our secret sauce is um, we, we get food and recipes and articles from um, chefs, cookbook authors. We bring in nutrition experts. We have a whole panel of PhDs and RDs who vet all of our stuff. We mix it together in the test kitchen where we test stuff, where we get stuff approved by our RDs. Those are our registered dietitians and out comes our expert content. Hi, guys. <laughs> um, so all of our content is very much science-based, and that's um, a difference from what you will see out there on the internet. Um, you can read health and nutrition um, advice and content and expert opinion um, you know, all day long on the internet, but um, it's not necessarily scientifically vetted. It's not necessarily research-backed, um, but that is really our position, is research-backed. Everything is run by the registered dietitians and the doctors and all of that stuff. We're not chasing fads. We might talk about a trendy new diet, but we're there to you know, debunk myths about it. So that's why our um, consumers turn to us, is they trust us as a source for you know, what's good, what's not good? What should they buy? 
Um, part of what we deliver for people, a, a big part, is food and it's um, variety and diverse food. So for instance, in this case, it was a Thanksgiving at the Chesapeake, and so you know Thanksgiving had some oysters in the stuffing and crab in it, so a little taste of diversity there. Um, and then um, diversity in, in our approaches to food. So um, the bulk of what our consumers want and what um, consumers of most food magazines want is fast dinner recipes. So they want it in 20 minutes, they want it in 30 minutes, but um, so we, we provide that for them, but we also provide a little bit of other stuff, a little bit of something more challenging for a special occasion, for a more experienced cook, for instance, as in this Galette story. Um, and then in some cases, too, we are um, setting trends or doing fresh new takes on things. So, um, you know, before pizza and salad sort of became a thing, you know, we, we had heard little buzzes about it and, you know, people were kind of starting to talk about it. So we thought, all right, let's put together a whole story about this. We planned a party. We had it at my mom's house. We brought a photographer, the food stylist, the whole nine yards and um, shot a pizzalid party and introduced our readers to the word pizzalid. Um, <laughs> um, then we, a big part of our brand is looking at fresh in-season produce. So on the cover of every magazine is a whole food, it's a fruit or a vegetable. This issue is olives. And by the way, an aside, um, I brought copies for anyone. At the end, you're welcome to take them. Um, so this, you know, our um, focus on in-season fruits and vegetables isn't that different from other magazines in that they, of course, are going to be using in-season stuff. And at the 4th of July, they're going to be talking about barbecuing too. But we really, you know, celebrate the beauty of fruits and vegetables. And we always have at least one, if not two, stories focusing on them, um, looking at the nutrition benefits of them. Um, and the recipes we deliver are achievable, so they're step-by-step -step recipes. We're holding the reader's hand through things so that they can get the results we get in the test kitchen. Um, and the approach that we take is not strict. So this is a diet story in which these women cooked delicious dinners and they shared them with each other um, and they all lost weight. It's not about um, eliminating stuff, cutting carbs, you know, only eating protein, any of that stuff. It's really about moderation. <laughs> this is a story that we did about chili. So we talk about the stories behind your food. These guys are two chili experts. There's this whole sort of subculture of chili heads who are into, you know, breathing the hottest pepper in the world and getting their pepper into the Guinness Book of World Records. So we turned to these two experts and did a fun profile on these guys to get at the stories behind your food. Um, and then we're also getting at the stories behind your food of how it impacts the environment, how it impacts your community, how it impacts your family, and in turn, what kind of choices you need to make around your food at the supermarket. And then this is a, a big pillar of what we're known for is um, the really digging into the most cutting edge nutrition science that is out there. So um, this is a story looking at the latest on sugar and the problems about sugar. Um, and that kind of story, along with all of our other mix of stuff, has been um, well recognized um, out there in the world with a lot of awards for journalism. So 40 flat, 45 plus journalistic awards in the last 10 years, 27 James Beard awards or nominations, um, this, this Burt Green is the IACP, the International Association of Culinary Professionals, so we have a bunch of those. Um, our editors are going on national TV, like the Today Show, um, Dr. Oz Show. So we're out there, we're in the mix, we're getting recognized for it, and we're all doing it from right here in Vermont, which is um, not typical at all. So most major national magazines are in New York. Um, so we have a little bit of a cool and lucky little position that we're in. Um, so how did we get here? Um, so I said we'd been around 20 years. We have, sort of. Um, we were started in the early 90s. We went out of business in the late 90s, and then we restarted 
um, quickly. There was like a two or three year hiatus. We restarted in 2002 with the original founding editor, James Lawrence. Um, and James is a great visionary. He wanted to have this beautiful magazine, glossy paper, big format, no advertising. And um, there's actually some of our original investors, I think, in the room here. Um, so that, uh, that plan um, was cool, and it was a beautiful magazine, but it wasn't making money. And um, I think about 2004 or 2005, the board said, hey, James, you got to start taking some advertising. So we started taking some advertising. That was slow. Um, and then in 2006, a new CEO came in. and said, all right, we're going to put in place a new business plan, guys. This, you know, just basic, you know, small niche magazine thing, this business isn't going to cut it. So um, you can keep going with this circulation and advertising model, um, but we got to grow digital and we've got to grow licensing. Um, his whole concept was you guys have unique um, and highly qualified content and it's something that there's a demand for, and you can license it and make money from that. And so we'll keep the magazine going along, and meanwhile, we're gonna ramp up the digital and the licensing, and the projections were that eventually, um, the digital and, and licensing business would outpace the magazine business and overtake in terms of revenue. Um, it proved out to be correct, and by 2010, I believe, we broke even. That was the first year we broke even. We were making money by 2011. Our licensing business had started booming, and um, back in those days, it was really centered around um, the big portals, Yahoo, MSN, AOL, um, and then some of the more um, uh, focus sites like WebMD. So our content was out there everywhere on the web, and we were being paid for it. Plus, our own audience was growing. And um, so Meredith Publishing took note. They're a big publishing company headquartered in Des Moines, Iowa. They're one of the big couple in the US. They own a ton of magazines, um, everything from parents to fitness to Better Homes and Gardens. They took note, hey, this little upstart in Vermont is actually being successful. It's growing. It's making money. And they have this really cool licensing business. Um, by that point, we'd actually expanded the business to, um, we were licensing content to grocery stores. We had started a magazine for the military. So all the military commissaries around the world had this magazine that we publish. Um, all the independent grocers association, we did a magazine for them. You know, you go into the Shelburne supermarket, that's an Eating Well magazine in there, except it's sort of covered to look like it's from the Independent Grocers Association. So Meredith kind of took note and went, huh, this is something, we're a big publishing company, we're not doing this, these guys are innovating, and they're making money, so they bought us. Um, they moved us into new offices, so we had been down in Charlotte, they moved us up to Shelburne, but that was huge, because um, they could have very easily said, Eating well, come on, you're going to Des Moines, all the, you know, all you editors, I know you don't want to move here, you're fired, bye-bye. Um, but they kept us here. Um, our, our CEO made a big um, argument for the fact that this brand had a real connection um, and affinity for Vermont, so they kept us here and um, expanded for us. And um, expanded video has been one of the biggest things that we've expanded into um, since they bought us. So this is a little bit of a picture about how the business, all the pieces of the puzzle fit together. So in the middle is the magazine, it's the flagship, it's the content generator. So it's this idea of create once, as in for the magazine, publish everywhere. So all around it, um, you'll see mobile. So we've got the mobile site, we've got tablets, um, we've got digital. So by our Omniture, which are internal metrics, we have about 5 million unique visitors a month right now on the website. We've got newsletters. Um, we've got marketing partnerships. We have really cool research, which I'll touch on as we go through. We had a million fans on Facebook this year. We're up to, I think, almost 1.2 million right now. We're just starting to dabble in Instagram. We're still small there. Um, Pinterest is huge for us. That's probably our number one social media traffic source. Um, and then we do books as well. So um, we had been on a tear with doing a whole bunch of books. We're going to get back into those. So where are we going? So when we were acquired back in 2011, we had 350,000 
paid circulation. So that means for each issue of the magazine, 350,000 people. Um, by next July, August, we'll be at a million, I just learned today. So that's very exciting. Um, right now, we're at 750,000. So still significantly larger than we were um, just two and a half years ago. Um, we're going to continue to grow digital. That's still a huge play for the business. Um, and part of that is growing the site, but it's also partially growing tools and apps and you know menu planners and customized things. So going to the whole next level in terms of sophistication on what consumers can do with our content on the website and on their phones. Um, Licensing, so licensing business has changed quite a bit. So the licensing business has really turned much more towards um, healthcare. Um, we're still licensing in these other places, but what has become apparent is um, health insurance companies, hospitals, pharmaceutical companies, all of these kinds of companies need to be able to support patients and deliver um, programs to them to help them lose weight, you know, bring down their cholesterol, lower blood pressure, manage diabetes. And a lot of these things are lifestyle changes that they want to help their customers implement. So, um, and these companies have a lot of money. So this has been a huge space of growth for us for the licensing business. Um, brand licensing is something that we are hoping to get into. So brand licensing is a little bit different from content licensing. Basically, take our name and put it on healthy frozen meals, for example. Um, it wouldn't be my first choice of how we would license our brand name, but it's possible for the right um, partner. Um, and then video, we will see, probably will continue to grow, and books will continue to grow. Um, we are working on our next big book, which is The Vegetable Bible. So. That brings it all back around to me and the personal. So what do I do? What is an editor-in-chief anyway? Um, so I'm the brand leader. And that means I'm the brand leader across all platforms. And it's sort of a nebulous thing. What does that mean, the brand leader? I mean, literally, I lead my team, which is the editorial team. I'm their boss. And I say yes or no to them You know, when we're making editorial decisions. But it's up to the editor-in-chief to sort of have the vision for the brand. Where is the brand going? How should the brand be talking? Is this appropriate for the brand to cover? Is this um, something that our readers are interested in? How should we explain this content? Is this something our readers already understand? Do we need to dumb this down for our readers? And it's sort of up to the editor-in-chief to help the whole team um, the editorial team understand the brand and um, sort of put together content that works properly for the brand. Um, so that means I define the style, the look, and the tone. Um, this was my first um, editorial letter from the editor. Um, and so, you know, I put myself in a vineyard across the street from our offices. That's Shelburne Vineyards because that was part of what I decided, you know, in my thinking about becoming editor-in-chief, I decided this is really important. I want Vermont to play a bigger role in this brand. I think Vermont is, um, stands for a lot of the same things that this brand talks about, and there's no reason that we shouldn't be playing up the fact that we are right here. We're living it, breathing it every day, because you know, the people in Brooklyn like to talk about the things that we like to talk about, but they don't have that in their backyard. So um, that was my, you know, sort of stake in the ground with my first letter, like, here I am, ladies and gentlemen, ladies, really. Uh, we don't have that many men in our audience. Um, so what else I do? I work with the ad sales team. So the publisher of the magazine is in charge of ad sales, um, but it is the role of the editor-in-chief to work with the publisher. I will go out on sales calls with them. Last week I was in Chicago at a bunch of um, ad agencies going and doing presentations, um, talking to potential advertisers. I work with the circulation department, so th those are the consumer marketing experts. They're the ones who send out the little mailers that say, hey, do you want to subscribe to Eating Well Magazine? You know, $8.99 for 12 issues. Um, and I get to drive cover choices, which is a very fun part of my job. Um, so 
the editor in chief is really the editor of the front page of the magazine. I don't often actually, um, I'm not usually the handling editor on stories within the magazine, but this page is all mine. And um, of course, I work with my team on it, especially my creative director. But um, this is the first place where you see the tone, see what this magazine is all about. Um, and it's important because this drives um, newsstand sales. So for the subscribers, all my family who gets the magazine, um, it doesn't really matter as much. I mean, yes, I want the cover lines to get them to open it up so it doesn't just sit on their sideboard, but what it's really about is selling those 50,000 copies that we typically sell on the newsstand. In the grand scheme of things, that's not a huge mix, but it does have a little bit of impact up or down on your um, total circulation size and on your revenue. So um, it's important. And the, the mix of um, the cover is really about finding that beautiful image. Um, for me, it's picking the subject. You know, what are we going to put on there this month? And then coming up with those cover lines that are going to be the big sells. Um, we do extensive testing on this stuff, which is really, really fun. Um, so we have a whole panel who gets these surveys from us. Um, we send out the survey. They get three cover choices. They get to choose which one they like best. And then they go on and they highlight with their cursor um, their favorite cover lines. And so then I get this really cool heat map report where it says, how three women lost 60 pounds, you can too. And it shows that 52% you know, of the respondents love that cover line. And so it, it, you get to do all different cover lines on all three different covers. And then you know, I sort of put, put it together and puzzle it together and come up with what my mix is. The other thing that I use is um, Facebook. And this has become hugely powerful and actually so powerful, I'm not even sure we're going to use it anymore. Um, so, Four months ago, we put up a cover test and we got something like 3,000 comments on Facebook within the first day. Last week, we put up a cover test. We got 16,000 comments in the first day. So obviously, we can't call through 16,000 comments on a cover test. Uh, what we did was we, we sort of did a sampling of those and we counted up something like you know 500 of them to see which choice our Facebook fans use. But it's pretty cool how um, powerful that's become for us to be able to talk with our audience immediately and see what they want. Um, so I, a big part of the editor-in-chief's role is bringing together the team to brainstorm story ideas um, and staying on top of the trends to know what's going to play well with the audience. So um, you know, this is an example of a story. This is about cauliflower, um, where we sort of all came together. Our digital digital um, editor was saying, "Hey, guys, I'm seeing this spike in searches on cauliflower, and there's these new recipes around cauliflower pizza, and people are doing all this funky stuff with cauliflower these days." And it was Google data that we started noticing this in, and then we started, you know futzing around and looking, and we notice, oh my god, this is you know, something that is definitely an up and coming thing. So um, you know, we collaborated. We put together the story. The um, Test Kitchen team tested all these recipes. We actually had a local author here work on them. The nutrition editor worked on all these little sidebars. You know, because the cool thing about cauliflower is not only is it um, a sort of a culinary, you know, wonder, wonder vegetable. It can do all sorts of things, but it's also super healthy. So this was a great way for the whole team to come together on a story. Um, a big part of what I do is I balance the lineup. So um, I don't want to have a story about cauliflower and a story about broccoli in the same issue, because that would be redundant. Um, I want to make sure that the lineup covers all of our sweet spots. So. I want to cover delicious food. I want to cover important nutrition topics. And I want to cover origins. Where does your food come from? So this is an example of a story about um, beef, but um, it's about grass-fed beef. And this guy um, is a farmer, very innovative farmer in Georgia. I had come across him at a um, conference I was at. So um, this is a perfect example of where we go, where I'm looking at the whole year, and I go, you know what, we need to do some sort of you know, sustainability and sort of um, you know, sustainability origin story. So I'll slot those in here. This 
photo is also from another one of those kind of slotted in stories. So this was about Gulf shrimp. Um, and a big part to, you know, besides getting that right mix in the editorial lineup is working with the creative director to come up with the imagery um, because a magazine is nothing without its beautiful images. So working with a creative director to get great, powerful storytelling images like this one of these guys loading up shrimp. And then besides those images, we need to have great stories around food. And for us today, this is more important than ever because we are um, providing recipes which have become a commodity. They're out there everywhere. They're user generated. There's zillions of them. They're free. You don't need Eating Well Magazine to deliver you a recipe. Uh, but you do need Eating Well Magazine to tell you a great story about that food. And so that's a big part of um, what I help my editors do is find those interesting stories around the food. Um, because that's what sets apart a magazine. So this is, you know, preserving has become hot and hip these days. Um, this gal is the authentic, real deal. Her name's April McGregor. We discovered her through uh, uh, a writer in the South that we know, um, and she wrote a beautiful story about her for us. Um, the editor-in-chief also would be in charge of conceptualizing special issues. So um, the September, October issue, this story was in there and that whole issue was centered around Italian food. So it's a little bit of what is our reader going to love and a little bit of what is also going to help us bring in advertisers that aren't normally with us. So Bertoli olive oil, for instance, um, I think came into this issue. And we had a couple of pasta advertisers in this issue. Um, and then redesigning the magazine. So we're always, always, always working on getting better. I'm always working with my creative director on making it stronger looking, um, talking with the editors about pulling apart departments. Should this department go in the back? Should it go in the front? Should we kill this one altogether? So always working on redesigning, reformulating. This, for instance, um, this page was um, a page that was newly added when we redesigned in JanFeb with my first issue. Um, it's called Tastemakers. Previously, the back of the magazine, the last page, had been an essay. So like a 700 word, dense, all text essay. Um, I, I liked the essay, but I didn't like it as an entry point to the magazine. I think the back page is really important. So one of the first things I changed was I wanted to put something in that was um, more visually driven and more um, easily digestible text. So that's what this came from. This is a very fun part of my job. Um, I get to read all the letters from, from readers. And um, the cool thing about Eating Well is we really are impacting people's lives. They really are using us. So um, just a couple for you guys. Um, I'm a far cry from being a chef, but I certainly ate like I was one today. Thanks to your suggestions on page 40 of the JanFeb issue. That's great. Um, I, must, I just read your toast to the new year. That was the editor's letter that I showed you guys. And wanted to tell you how much it meant to me. You joined me with my morning coffee with my dog, Foxy. Thank you for that. It was a pleasure for sure. Oh my god. It touches my heart. I can't believe it. Um, and then this is about this latest issue, which you guys can take. Um, I cannot tell you how much I'm enjoying the September-October issue, particularly the Italian section. I've read every word of it twice. I feel like I've taken a tour of Italy through the eyes, words, and photos of people who passionately love Italy and its food. I have flagged no less than seven recipes to try. This is a kind of record for me with one magazine. Thank you, Russ Glad in Tucson, Arizona. So um, that's a very fun part. And then you know we get to put together the feedback. Um, <clears throat> all right, so to sum it up, how the heck did I get here anyway? Um, as Bob mentioned, it's maybe not the most conventional path. I was an art history major, graduated in 1995. Um, and I knew I did not want to go to grad school. I was confused. I was in San Francisco. Um, my dad told me, if you don't know where you're going, any path will get you there. And that was basically like, just, just do something, anything. It doesn't matter. Just do it, okay? 
So I did it. Um, I became a pantry cook in a restaurant. It was hard. It was grueling. I loved the energy of cooking in the restaurant. It was very, um, a lot of adrenaline and excitement. Um, but at the same time, it was grueling, and I realized that's not my career path. Um, I became a media planner, so I went to work in an ad agency. I was planning um, ad campaigns in magazines back in my early 20s, so that'll come back around. Um, I then went from the ad agency to a market research company um, where I was selling audience measurement data that was used by ad agencies. Um, again, not in my wheelhouse. It wasn't about food, which was my real you know, thing that I was totally obsessed with. It certainly wasn't art history, um, but I worked my butt off at this market research firm. Um, by 2001, I had been named the top salesperson in that company, um, which is pretty cool. You know, I was doing well um, at my job, but by 2003, I was a little bit burnt out, a little bit bored, and you know, if you don't know where you're going, any path will get you there. Well, I wasn't there, so I quit my job, and I decided to come to Vermont to take time off. And this was my first bit of serendipity. So I got a call from my sister who was freelance recipe testing at Eating Well, and she said, Eating Well needs a little bit of extra help. Can you come you know, test recipes for them? Um, they're not going to pay you very much, and I know you're trying to take four months off, but come on, recipe test. So I said, oh, why not? That sounds amazing. Working for a food magazine is like a dream. You know, I don't care what I'm doing. I'll come. So I did that for four months. I went back to San Francisco, and a year later, I got a call. Um, the, someone who I had been testing with in the test kitchen um, had been hired as the food editor. And he said, hey, Jesse, do you want to move back here to Vermont? Um, we can offer you um, one-fifth of what you are currently making, <laughs> and we won't pay for you to move across the country. Um, and you will just be testing recipes. You won't be writing anything or editing anything. It's not a lot of responsibility, but it's a cool job. And I said, oh my god. I talked to my husband, and uh, he said he didn't want to come to the dark, cold Northeast. Um, but we decided to take a chance. And we said, you know what? Yeah, just go. It could be a year or two. You know, we just got to try this. I, I just got to try this. You know, this is, a, this is a cool opportunity. So I came. Um, in 2006, my boss left, um, and I was promoted to the food editor position. I was not qualified for the food editor position, but I was promoted because I was there. Um, and I was scrappy enough and eager enough. Um, I worked my way up. I became the deputy editor. And last year, my boss left in June. And um, they asked me to be the interim editor-in-chief in June. And um, they said, we're going to conduct a national search for someone who's actually qualified to be the editor-in-chief. <laughs> Um, because you have no experience, and um, so we want to find someone who, who could do the job, who you know, has some experience and qualifications. But if you want to throw your hat in the ring, go ahead. Um, so I said, yeah, yeah, let me do it, let me do it. And so um, all summer long, from June all the way through September, I was working my butt off, and I was just you know, so stressed out. I was doing all my food editing duties, but also acting as editor-in-chief. And in September, I got the job, obviously. Um, so <laughs> what is my secret recipe? How did it all happen? These are my life lessons for all you students. Um, first of all, get lucky. Take pride in your work, no matter what it is. Jump in and get it done. Get along with people. Don't follow the money. And follow your passion. So the first one. This is a cliche that women say this about themselves. Oh, I was just lucky. I was just really lucky. But in my case, it's really true. I was really lucky. I was at the right place at the right time. I got that phone call. I got my foot in the door. But um, there is something to saying yes and to realizing there's an opportunity when it hits and being willing to jump in and you know, take that leap and move all the way across the country for a fifth of the salary um, and just say, oh, well, who knows? Um, I'm going to try it. So yes, I was lucky, but you also make your own luck and you sort of take advantage when it comes. 
Um, and part of that too, I think, is always talking to people. You never, ever, ever know where you are going to bump into that person who is just going to be that connection that you need um, to make something happen. And then, of course, don't be afraid to take advantage of personal connections, like your sister working at a magazine. Um, this one is take pride in your work no matter what it is. So always do a great job. So this goes back to my experience um, you know, in college, working at restaurants, being the media planner, um, working at Comscore Media Metrics where I was you know, doing that market research job. Um, I put this example on here, cut the bread correctly when you work at a Relay and Chateau Resort. Um, so I was working at this, at this resort in um, Clark, Colorado, outside Steamboat, and uh, I had the duty sometimes of cutting the bread. These loaves were hand-baked, you know, fresh out of the oven that the cooks would make every morning. And usually the wait staff would come in and they'd hack the bread and the slices would be all mangled and off kilter and the end of the bread would have to be thrown away because the wait staff was just hacks, you know, they would just be making a mess of the bread. And one day the chef came over as I was slicing the bread and he had hired me as a pantry cook. So, I mean, presumably he thought I knew something about cooking, but he looked over my shoulder and he said, oh, you can cut bread. <laughs> and, you know, that, that he, he remembered that. And after that, he started giving me more responsibility. You know, so it's those little things and you never know what it is, but it, it makes a big difference. Um, and then going, you know, going back to the Comscore Media Metrics, the market research job, you know, getting that, you know, salesperson of the year. You know, I'm not in the same field anymore, but it doesn't hurt to be able to put that on your resume. So that's something always to remember is even if it's not your dream field, it's not going to hurt you to do, um, you know, the best and take pride in your work. And then the other thing is, learn everything you can. So that's part of taking pride in your work because you never know when you're going to be able to apply something that you've learned before in the future. Um, it, it happened to me very directly. Um, all that experience I have as a media planner is really paying off now as the editor in chief because for the first time in my magazine career, I am now actually having to use that stuff that I did close to 20 years ago now. So that's pretty cool. Um, jump in and get it done. So this is just an obvious one. Um, although I, I don't know if the first one, no task is below you, is that obvious to everyone. I've seen this happen with a lot of uh, people that they think something is, you know, <laughs> below them, that they act like a prima donna. No one likes that. No one wants that in an office. Um, I have always taken the approach of, Sure, I'll you know schlep the coffee around. I'll help plan the you know company party. I will go and serve food to the you know board of trustees. Whatever, I don't care. It's not below me. Um, it served me very well, and I think it's something that you know is good to remember. Um, and then when a project or need arises, even if it seems like it's way, way, way more than you can handle, raise your hand and say yes. This has never. Um, never really come back to bite me at all. I can say there's three big things that happened in my, in my career at Eating Well um, that I think are instrumental and they all go back to this one, which is the first one was cookbooks. So in 2006, um, when my old boss left, um, we were doing these cookbooks and my boss then came to me, the editor in chief at the time, and she said, you know, we don't really have a ton of budget. Do you think it would be possible to do these cookbooks in house? Just you do the cookbook, um, you're the author on the cookbook, you put it together with your team. And I said, you mean and do a magazine too? Uh, okay, sure, we'll figure out how to get it done, fine. You know, and it did mean some long nights and some stress and some weekends at the office, but I ended up having um, six or seven cookbooks to my name and a James Beard Award to my name. So that can't hurt you. Um, I also then, had an experience where the art director of the company left. And, you know, as the food editor, you're not the art director. You don't plan the photo shoots. That's a whole other humongous job. But the art director left. We were in a total pinch. Most of the photo shoots are, were of food content or are of food content. So I said, 
don't worry about it. Give me, you know, I will create a budget spreadsheet. I will schedule all the photos. I will handle this. I did it for six to eight months. And, um, you know, it wasn't maybe the most beautiful period of the magazine, but it was pretty good. And it got us through to when we were able to hire an actual professional art director. And then, of course, this also happened to me when they said, hey, Jesse, can you act as the interim editor in chief? Um, you know, while we look for someone more qualified than you. And I said, OK, okay fine. Um, the reason I say you should do this is you get a broader experience of the business that you're in, duh, obviously. Uh, but you also get to show that you can handle it. You can handle the responsibility. You can step up to the plate. You start getting imagined into bigger roles, broader responsibilities, higher levels within a company. Get along with people. This is not a joke. Um, being good at your job is really important, but if you're not getting along with people, it does not really matter because no one wants a pain in the neck in the office. Um, so that means that you should be good to work with people, like use common courtesy, um, all of that sort of stuff. But also know that you're going to need to work with difficult people. For me, that's been a huge part of why I've been able to succeed is that I am good, I would say, at working with a broad range of personalities. And um, you know, being adaptable and being able to communicate with a lot of different um, people with different communication styles can really, really serve, your well, serve you well. Um, part of that, to me, is being a diplomat, but not a yes woman. Um, I think managing upward towards your boss is very, very important. Um, and I don't think that means that you just have to support and say yes to everything that they, that they are asking for. Um, I think showing that you have an opinion um, and doing it in a diplomatic way and knowing when to back down when you just say, hey, you're the boss. It's ultimately your decision is a real skill. Um, that can serve you well. And I think this is really, obviously, it's important in publishing. One would think it was a natural in publishing. It's not necessarily. Um, but it's really just as important in other fields as it is in publishing. Um, I find, you know, even within Eating Well, you know, we have a whole tech group. The ones who are the most successful are the ones who can communicate outside their group. And they are the ones who are being promoted. Um, so there's all sorts of. A any industry you're in, I think this can't serve you wrong. Um, don't follow the money. Um, I think get your foot in the door, work your butt off. The money should follow, hopefully. If it doesn't, um, the job offers probably will. Or if you go shopping yourself for a job, you probably will get a better offer. We find this all the time at Meredith that um, we aren't able to increase salaries enough, and our great, really qualified people are getting poached by other companies. So it's good for those employees um, who are you know, getting raises as they're moving off to uh, other publishers. It's not great for us, but um, I would just say the lesson there is don't, don't follow the money. Do what you love. Follow your passion. Um, because if you're following your passion, you're going to love your job, and that's what makes a job fun and sustainable in the long run. Um, but my advice is lots and lots of people tell me they're passionate. Um, probably whatever field you're interested in going into, you're passionate about. Um, every letter I get on my desk with a resume, they are telling me that they're passionate. I don't ever want to read that word again. Um, and I definitely don't want to read that word if there's nothing on your resume that shows me that you're passionate. So do something, do anything related to your passion that you can put on your resume. Um, I worked for caterers. I read every single thing I could possibly read about food. I ate at every restaurant in San Francisco I could possibly afford to go to. I took food writing classes. So. Um, you know, anything you can do around your passion is a really important. And then when you are applying for that job, show, don't tell. So um, again, this goes back to don't tell me you're passionate, show me you're passionate. Tell me a story about how your passion played out in your life. Um, share an experience that demonstrates um, that passion. So that's it.
That's the end. <laughs> Any questions? Yes? I have two questions. One, with some of the recent movies like The Hundred Foot Journey, yeah. that are very food focused, um, how does eating well tap into that enthusiasm for food? I don't, I'm not familiar with that movie. Oh, it is? It's a fabulous movie, and I just thought, you know, with, with all that you do, it might be an interesting tie-in. Oh, it sounds cool. I'll have to check it out. You know, we don't, I, I'm not sure exactly what the movie is about, but we don't tend to cover restaurants that much and chefs. We really like that back page with the tastemakers, try and um, cover real people. Um, our heroes are the farmers and the producers much more than the, sort of the big celebs and the macho chefs and all that stuff. So um, that's our take on, on that kind of stuff, typically. Yeah. Yes. How might students uh, be helpful and add value to your organization in maybe an internship capacity? Well, that's a great question. So um, we don't have a huge internship program. We do have a small one. Um, and we tend to um, look for um, interns, students who have either journalism um, as their focus or will look for food focus or um, nutrition. So people who are in registered dietitian programs or from culinary schools and typically with a BA and in culinary school um, and then some journalism students as well. So um, we have them on the editorial side in the summer and um, they usually come in and they uh, spend eight to 12 weeks with us and usually around 30 hours a week and they help us research, they help write articles, they do more menial things like organizing our library and you know helping on photo shoots so we'll have them help with you know styling food and stuff like that um, but it's typically only two a, a summer and then I know our um, business development and licensing side of the business just started with an intern um, so I think they may actually be moving into having interns more regularly also yeah Hi. Um, besides the cover text thing that you're saying that you put on yeah. Facebook and Apple Watch on, yeah. what are some other really engaging campaigns that you guys put on Facebook or any other social media? Um, well, there's one that we just did that's just wrapping up um, tomorrow, which is called the Eating Well Slim Down Challenge. And um, so this was basically we decided um, in Jan Feb, we always do a diet store. It's new year, new you, you know, help lose weight. Um, so we decided, you know what, we want to find some readers who want to lose weight with us. Our food editor wanted to lose weight. So we're going to get those readers and um, we're going to recruit them on Facebook and create a Facebook group and um, around this slim down challenge idea as a 12 week challenge. So we put up a post. We got 5,000 people to join the group. And um, so over the 12 weeks, we basically had them weigh in on every Wednesday. The food editor was leading the group, so his pins were at the top of the group, or his posts were pinned to the top of the group every day. Um, and he was talking about you know, his exercise, what he was eating, tips for staying healthy and losing weight. Um, and the community within this group was just amazing it was so engaged so every day they were in there posting talking about their weight talking about their successes their failures so that was um, really amazing and we've come away with um, we've narrowed it down to seven success stories we're probably only going to profile four of them in the magazine but they will be profiled in the magazine yeah exactly so we're sending out professional photographers we're going to do really cool photos of them sort of um, you know, hopefully in beautiful environments, doing stuff that they love to do, and it'll be big spreads in the magazine. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. So you said this is your, um, you have the best job in the world. Is this your best job in the world for you? Yeah. What's, um, what's your second best? What, what's the next thing that you could think of 
Or another way of asking that is, do you think there is any other thing that would take you away from this? That make you say, gee, I think I'll walk away from this and do this next thing. Uh, you know, that's a really hard question. I am not a good planner. I am terrible at having a vision of five years from now, what do I want to be? Where do I want to you know, end up? Um, I suck at that, so I don't know. Um, but I, I mean, I'm, I am a li in a little bit of a, a rock and a hard place because my old job as food editor, I already thought that was the coolest job in the world. And this one, I have to deal with a little bit more crap than I had to deal with in my old job. And I, in my old job, I was way more like in the fun stuff. I was in the test kitchen. And, um, you know, it was just like a, a naturally more fun job. But I like growing and doing new things. And so even though I'm dealing with a little more, you know, junk sometimes, I'm okay with it. And we'll see what comes next. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks for coming. <laughs>